I think we'll go ahead and get started. I want to thank everybody for coming out tonight on this uh, absolutely amazing and beautiful fall that we've been having. This weather has just been something else, and I'm sure everybody's had a chance to, to enjoy that. Um, go 2030. Um, we are probably getting close to the midway point in our comprehensive plan updates, and, and I can tell most everybody that's here has been at other meetings, and it's, it's great to see uh, the, the kind of involvement that we've had. Um, tonight, I'm excited to present uh, Kinji Akagawa, who is a teacher and artist uh, from the Twin Cities area. Um, he is a 1983 uh, McKnight Artist Fellowship uh, Award winner, as well as a 2007 McKnight Extinguished Artist uh, as well. Um, some of his works um, are uh, the Peace Garden Bridge at Linden uh, Peace Park, and uh, you can also see some of his work, uh, the pergola that's erected at the entryway of the Normandale a community college in the Twin Cities is, is something as well that you might want to take a look at. Also, I wanted to mention that uh, the Plains Art uh, helped sponsor uh, tonight's speaker, as well as the Department of Visual Arts at NDSU. So I want to give a special thanks to them for helping to sponsor our, our speaker. And with that, I'd like to welcome you to the podium. Thank you for your thanks. Well, it's an incredible day outside, and uh, we shouldn't be sitting here, first of all. <laughs> but uh, it was a wonderful drive from uh, my home, Afton, Minnesota, which is only about a uh, half hour away from Twin Cities towards uh, Wisconsin. It took me about four and a half hours to get here, but it was just uh, gorgeous, incredible. I think uh, today is the best day in the whole year to drive from Twin Cities to here. <laughs> No question about that. So, thank you for having me. And uh, today's presentation, uh, somewhat, I have a few examples, uh, case studies uh, of uh, what I am interested in personally, our uh, nature of aesthetic experience, rather than calling it art or not art. But uh, do we have any positive experience of uh, aesthetics? Uh, sociologically as well as uh, philosophically, some of the things. So I'd like to share some of the uh, slides. But uh, first of all, uh, uh, before I go on to slide, uh, today's presentation, I don't want to be lectured, okay? I want to be a conversation a little bit more. I'm a public artist, so I'm no authority of anything. <laughs> it's just I, I collaborate with a lot of uh, different groups of people. I learn from them. I, I hope I'm teaching them something uh, different uh, background and a different integrity in uh, interdisciplinary area. But uh, today, uh, uh, while I'm presenting, I have Megan uh, uh, from the museum. Okay, she will be my co-worker today. Okay, so uh, uh, I gave her a few articles to read and uh, she will be much better reader for sure. And uh, so I need her assistance. So uh, we'll be doing together on the beginning as well as uh, our tail end of it. And uh, our today's, okay, uh, is this working? Yeah. Is that okay? Yeah. Today's uh, our title is uh, Feeling Beauty in the City. Okay, I'd like to focus on onto this uh, issue and the transforming the Art Fargo Mohead landscapes in the plural. And uh, my title is a public artist, uh, a little bit different than uh, just uh, calling it artist, so different concerns. Okay, uh, uh, let's see. This is, uh, oh, oh, there we go. And uh, this is uh, sort of my statement, idea of uh, public art, how we participate. So it's my statement, so, but... Uh, Megan is going to read it for me. Are? Okay. Here we are. Aren't we all involved in civic activities in, this, in the city of Fargo-Moorhead? I am often asked, what is public art? As though this is completely different than from private art. Well, of course, the aesthetic experience of our world appears in both spaces, private spaces as well as public spaces and more. This aesthetic experience participates in cultural, emotional, human development, especially towards democratic world or inc self-inclusive, not self-exclusive, democratic processes. This vis vision of our aesthetic activity, both 
of both arts and letters is deeply embedded in our life activities in spite of our expanding quest for economic growth and technical expertise. Art and letters are always egalitarian activities. If our activities are going to be called our, our aesthetic life, then the arts and letters must give and instill or instill growth in our human intelligence and discover of this old world as well as our new world. For example, the Plains Art Museum activities and the director Colleen Sheehy's efforts to provide diversity of artist participation and citizens' participation with the museum. I believe that through the arts and letters, with hearts and hands, we, can touch, we touch each other. We remember the natural world and diversity of our beautiful culture. Indeed, I feel, not that, I feel that not only our hearts called for the arts and letters, but we also actually need them in order to better our environments and ourselves. That's the kind of uh, concern I have. I hope it's OK as a beginning. And uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's the uh, arts and the letters. It's a coexisting. Uh, it's uh, poets and the painters, let's say. Uh, language is very important, as well uh, as uh, images. In, uh, in order to say, like, uh, let's say, pre-convention convention and the post-convention, three different activities, no matter what kind of profession we have, we deal with. And uh, pre-convention is the part, like uh, we orient ourselves uh, to move in the world and uh, to understand the world, and uh, we learn the conventions, uh, what is art, or what is design, what is architecture, what is banking, <laughs> what is money, all these. And the post-convention is that the once we understand that convention, let's say in Moorhead will be a little bit different than Twin Cities, Minnesota, economics and then the culture is a little different. Maybe New York is different, Tokyo is different, Paris is different. So each context that the post-convention will be a di little different proposal and a different thinking will be. So aesthetic also changes. Art in New York will be a little bit different than art in the Bay Area in San Francisco, as we know. So all these things are concerned. And what is American art has been my quest, not European definition of it authoritarian art. If European context is the most important part, maybe so many of us have no chance of showing even our work in the museums or galleries. We are such a multicultural America now, more than ever before. So how do we give ourselves each other to experience others' beauty as well as our, our self-inquiry? then the public art becomes one of the most important issues in our times as an artist or, a, let's say, teacher or a intellect. So, okay, uh, saying that, and uh, let's see. I hope this will work. This arrow will work? Oh, down this way? Okay. Oh, okay. Then uh, today's presentation will be, in order to talk about uh, feeling and the beauty and the city, I sort of uh, uh, separated into four different kind of things, and uh, independent issue as well as uh, interdependent, all these are not separated. And one is a built environment la landscape. Uh, these are buildings, parks, gardens, uh, something we share every day. Uh, comes into our vision as well as uh, audio and the smells and the restaurant smells, all these things. So it's a built environment. Human being landscape is the first example that uh, I will have uh, uh, Megan read. And then this uh, article oh, just uh, came out. Oh, uh, I, I'll have that. And the second one uh, is a human being landscape. What kind of human beings we are, what kind of value system we have. And the third one is a natural landscape. How do we take care of the, the, the natural landscape? And also, now, it's a multicultural, multi-sensual uh, uh, world, and how do we go about? And the idea of crisis of confidence is that we do not admire each other, not much anymore. How often do you use, you are beautiful? How often do we say, 
you are incredibly fantastic human being. <laughs> we, once you make a statement, you are responsible <laughs> for your statement, and you don't have much of the, our confidence, then we don't say each other beautiful, <laughs> beautiful city or beautiful landscape. And then these are kind of problematic part. And then uh, let's say opposite of beauty is not the ugliness. It is harmful. What is harmful is not beautiful. We often think in the dictionary just ugliness is the opposite word. No, maybe ugly right now, but uh, tomorrow may, may be a very, very beautiful thing. So somebody may be an uh, incredible truth about uh, women's issues or, or minority issues. So, these are the kind of uh, opposite is uh, harmful. Something harmful is not beautiful to me. So, all these are uh, kind of interrelated things, but uh, we look at these things uh, independent as well as uh, interdependent issues. I'm so pretty sure I just met a few landscape architects who are studying landscape architecture, and that's not separate from my issues of so-called public art issues or human being issues. We dwell together in the same way. So landscape, all these are very important. So that's our second one, the images. Okay, let's see. Our first one, case studies, first one just came out August 29th, this paper, our Megan will read. The second one is images of Nong in Minneapolis. And uh, this Miss Julepon was a Thai person. She was my mentee and a student. And she produced the work. I will show you that slide. And the third one is called the Kikoe Maska. It's a Linda Nishino. She teaches at the Otis Institute in Los Angeles, but the her young days work. And uh, uh, Ms. Euclid, uh, more Letterman Euclid, uh, is called the Social Miller. Uh, only one slide I have, but she's about 72 years old. She's still working very hard in the cultural social milieu. And uh, number fifth is uh, Tim Rollins. He's a teacher in uh, Brooklyn. But uh, he does uh, one project, beautiful stuff, and then I'd like to show you the example of that. So, okay, Megan, could you read the first readings? Uh, and uh, I'd like to see how you feel about this article. Okay, the first case study is a tour for people fast on their feet. A Minneapolis booster is an av and avid runner is offering narrated jogs for exercise-minded tourists. If Nate Harrington has his way, it won't be long before visitors are sending home postcards saying, have a sweaty time, wish you were here. Harrington, 28, who's, who says he loves Minneapolis more than anybody I know, and quote, loves running, well, not that much, but, but still a lot, has launched a business that combines two passions. City Running Tours offers jogs through the city that are led by guides who keep up a running commentary, so to speak, about the places they are trotting past. We talk about history, about the landmarks, about culture and sports, he said. For instance, while traveling past the Mill City ruins near the Stone Arch Bridge, runners hear about the city's flour milling routes. The goal is to have fun and learn something at the same time, he added. Although the tours were originally aimed at visitors, about 40% of the runners in the first summer have been locals. Harrington takes that as a sign that he and a staff of 10 guides have done their homework. Even the people who live here are learning things. For instance, we have more museums than Chicago. We have more theaters per capita than any other city in the country. They don't tell you these things when you're growing up. City running tours got it started in New York City. In addition to Minneapolis, there are franchises in Chicago, Boston, San Francisco, Seattle, Philadelphia, Charleston, South Carolina, and Washington, D.C. It was a natural fit for Harrington, who, was a who has a degree in business, was born and raised in Minneapolis, and likely would be running most, mostly on, on his own most days anyway. So I've, we've got so many great running paths in the city. When I hear about the concept, it seems, like, it seems like it was perfect for us. The runs are offered seven days a week, and so far each one has drawn participants. In fact, some days, he said, we have to, ha we have to offer two runs. We'll see what happens in the winter. But for now, the plan is to keep going. 
the runs, 5K on weekends and 10K on week, week sorry, 5K on weekdays and 5, 10K on weekends start from the Mary Tyler Moore statue at Nicollet Mall. The outing titles are self-descriptive. For instance, Cherry and Spoon Run goes to the Walker Art Center Sculpture Garden where the group can stop and pose for pictures. The guide carries a camera. The other runs include Skyscrapers and Stadium, Mill City, and one of Harrington, Harrington's favorites, the Beer Run, which includes a mid-run stop for three one-ounce samples of local brews. And then we sometimes end the run, and then sometimes at the end of the run, we have a little more if the runners are still interested. The guides match their pace to the group, and typically it's a comfortable nine-minute mile. Uh, if the runner is looking to do serious speed training, Harrington can arrange, that for, uh, arrange a guide for that too. Part of the fee goes to charity because, quote, that's what my parents taught me, unquote, said Harrington. Everybody comes out ahead. The runners have fun. The city gets a boost, and the charity gets a donation. Okay. Thank you very much. Yeah. What do you think? Yikes. Beer run. <laughs> Beer run. Yeah. Yeah. When I read the article, how wonderful it is. <laughs> Just a runner describing city and the history and the visitors come, they don't get into the sightseeing bus and they go around. Maybe bikers can do that, not just the runners. Maybe children can do that in a school yard. <laughs> okay. So all these uh, citizens' participation, only you have this kind of person in the city, you feel good. <laughs> Humanscape, landscape, grows that bigger. Isn't it? And especially money goes to charity. <laughs> kind of defiance of a certain idea of capitalist idea, yeah. But the communitarianism. Communitarianism at work. I want to visit that kind of city. <laughs> I think it's beautiful person, beautiful project. This may open up a lot more other activities for the, not just the runners, but the bikers and the hikers and then all the other stuff. So the citizens' participation becomes another endeavor. Whatever you're good at it, you can participate to welcome others and to defy the kind of everyday economic being to be a little bit step back and then put something forward. I think a human landscape will become bigger. That's the first one, okay? The next one is, uh, our, uh, this is my our Thai student. She has studied in Germany, Bauhaus, and I came to MCAD, and I was a mentor for her. And she was interested in public art and what kind of culture she came in. And uh, this is the, her statement, uh, what goes on. Oh, excuse me, my book. This small book, she has made at the end of a master's program, and I'll pass it around, but the, some of the photographs I have here, so I'll read. In all places but my birth country, I'm a foreigner, quote unquote. Now living in the United States and having made my home in Germany, Vietnam, and Thailand, I set out to make art about the living between cultures and how someone with a foreign, quote unquote, perspective can share insights with the dominant culture. Holding the three-foot clay sculpture Nung around the cities in two continents, I was able to open conversations first between me and other people, then hopefully between them and someone else. Each day when I went out to photograph Nung, I found new experiences and gained entry into other lives. And I will show you the slides. There's a Nung in the supermarket. Nung in front of wedding dress store. In silence. 
head of table in Chinese restaurant. Guess what? It's not smelling something else. So it's stuck. So that's the Jiva Bomb. Okay. She's, this project was so moved by her project. Not only she was understanding our culture, but that she was opening up her own. And uh, we learned her character. It was just a beautiful project. And oh, uh, this is the kind of human landscape opening up and uh, taking a chance. But uh, can you imagine totally unassumed open quest to understand others. You cannot have any kind of lineal thinking here. Every day she goes out and then have a dialogue with others. This is uh, our, uh, called the Kikoe Maska. Linda Nishino is the third generation of Japanese American. She teaches at the Otis Art Institute. You may, some of you may know. It's a very good art school in Los Angeles, and she's a professor there. But when she was about 28 years old, it's again women's issues and then the third generation, the minority, all these things. But she was behind the glass. She's saying, can you hear me? Can you hear my voice? It's kind of political <laughs> or cultural issues here. And uh, this was a uh, uh, broadcasted in uh, New York uh, in the public spaces. Okay. This is uh, Merle Latimer Euclid, another case. It's called the social mirror. On the side of the garbage truck is the mirror. And uh, it's on the parade. She does uh, all kinds of parades. These uh, invisible people from everyday life she tries to bring her up to the cultural level and then make it, them visible, especially in the garbage people or a garbage man. And she has shaken hands about 1,500 people in New York shook a hand and uh, changed the name from garbage people <laughs> to sanitary workers. And uh, this is uh, one of the parade that uh, on the side, so people who are watching this parade, they can see themselves uh, reflection on the garbage truck. This is uh, uh, one, another educator artist, Tim Rollins. Tim's uh, work, this called uh, America, is 1985 and 86, uh, somewhat older work. He was at uh, 30 years old teaching really the uh, uh, handicapped students in uh, uh, Bronx. And uh, what he did was uh, this one, he gave the uh, Kafka's uh, America and the students to read. And whatever Im images comes out of that reading, make the image. And uh, this is a collaboration about, uh, he is right now taking care of about maybe 15 students. One of them I noticed uh, from Minneapolis attending his school. But uh, he re let them read the book, uh, but at the same time, images from the book. And then he, in this case, each one, I don't know how well you can tell, but each one on the corner, it's a one page of the book. He deconstructs the whole the book and then make it into a canvas. And then students paint all these images onto that. So letters and the image is combined together. And the Deer Foundation and the Field Museum purchases this painting. The money goes into one part, end of the year, out of these 10, 15 students, they select who wants to go to art school, and he provides the tuition. How do you like that? Oh, 
Okay, great, great. Thank you. Tim's work. Okay. Right. <laughs> yeah. Tim, again, has a totally different idea of aesthetic experience. But the pedagogy is absolutely important here. So different landscapes he manipulates and he works with. So, okay. These are just the short case studies I am talking about. And this Nung is again, uh, his eyes closed, he cannot hear, he cannot sing, he cannot even maybe smell or taste. But uh, yet he seems to have an incredible presence to me <laughs> in terms of the uh, idea of uh, this emotional thinking deep or somewhat he's in a deep meditation. <laughs> He is a part of me. <laughs> part of me questions my own being. So there's a dialectic kind of condition goes on, or dialogical. So within that, okay, uh, just uh, all those uh, our samples. But uh, this is uh, this is a language. What they're operating is not the traditional format of. Uh, activities of painting, sculpture, printmaking, academics that I was used to study and under. Uh, every media was, uh, if I used oil paint, much better than sumi ink drawing. <laughs> that is selling higher and then mainstream. But uh, nowadays, uh, it's been talked about uh, whether that's uh, then our ethnicity Background is very important. So I have a Seto Jones. He's a black artist and then a beautiful guy. He's, he has been uh, called in different schools. And uh, could you show us what is black art? And he's sick and tired of uh, being called a black artist and a black art. as so different from white art or yellow art or red art. We need a new definitions and a new ways of going at it. And then uh, this uh, our one definition here is that uh, no longer in the United States we cannot talk about all these things just in Eurocentric definition of art experience or aesthetic experience. We have so many demands from students or cultural demand that we are already globally connected. We have multicultural experience, multidiscipline people, and it is almost feels like a chaos. And yet, out of this chaos, self-organization goes on. And we come up with a new aesthetic experience. It may not be called art. The first experience of that is not, he's not an artist, but I think he gives aesthetic experience for us. That's he can get into my criteria. If I'm a critic, he can be artist. Creative people. New relationship makes sense in the world, being that way. Being connecting me to that world. Nung connects me, being Nung himself. So, social mirror, of course, again, we have to think. She makes us think that what is visible, what is invisible, what is the social structure, what kind of value system I have. So, this is the one word that comes, and I'd like to read this one. Artists who create works which support the values of ruling class culture are ruling class artists. This is no longer ethnicity background or black or yellow or red. Ruling class culture who supports that is a, a ruling class artist. No matter what their color, the third world artist is one who produces in conscious opposition to the art of the ruling class. It is avant-garde art, let's say, traditionally. 
somebody who understands the ruling class or our dominant value system, and yet there's something oppressed or oppressor or majority-minority voices, especially women's movement, has been incredibly helpful for our cultural aesthetic experience out of 1960s and the 70s. Oh, uh, these are uh, the conscious opposition to art. Until our uh, women's art came, we are showing all the museums were man run, man directors. Thank you, Colin. You are coming in. And the Walk Art Center, our um, MIA, uh, Wiseman, it's all female now, <laughs> all the directors. And they're choosing a lot of different kind of performance, everyday work, new art and video art, installation art, new media, all these things young people are experimenting with the social cultural values. Their aesthetic experience has been provided for all of us to view and question and have a dialogue. This seems to be the democratic process. It's good. Critical views are very, very important here. So, I'll uh, read from here. Who produces conscious oppression of the art of the ruling class? Not just to cause trouble or to be different, but because the artist is sympathetic with third world people in other sectors of society and the world. Not all third world people are aware of their oppression, but all third world artists must be uh, our, because they are, by our definition, the voice of the oppressed. So, those who did not have the chance to show in the museums, they go on to street and the temporal works, or even musicians, after the 9-11 uh, event in Seattle, this cello player played incredible classical music on the street. Our poetry is no longer just a book publishing, but the readings in the bookstores and the public intellectuals that they become. Try to share their views or have a dialogue with the others. So these are aesthetic experiences, not the static experience. This is a dynamic experience of ourselves. We grow with them. We grow into the new world and the new values. This seems to be the creative activities. And this is the, our mixed blessing from Lucy Laparte. And Howard Smuggler says, new ways of understanding art and ourselves may be not traditional critical issues such as an artwork's visual style, quality, iconography, and the meaning. Contemporary criticism is more likely to focus on the works of artists' ideological, economic, political, and the social ramifications. The new criticism has, for the most part, uh, focused on the social process and interaction between producer-artist and the viewer-consumer, dialogical condition. New set of linguistic labels such as ideology, class, gender, sign, signifier, signified, the discipline of the social science and literary critical theory becomes important. Okay, so it's no longer just the artist producing art, but the critics produces a certain group of people. Museum certainly has a beautiful magic wand. These are the people's exhibition that I'd like to have. Questions to certain value systems and the structure. And then it talks with us. So it becomes a much more like an English idea of commons. Museum and space becomes commons. We can do throughout the year all kinds of events and the shows and activities together. So this is, seems to be the kind of interdisciplinary arts. Uh, and yet I think our painting, sculpture, printmaking, these things are very important. We affirm ourselves with uh, uh, all those values which are already our 
uh, intellectualized and formalized, and that's uh, our identity. Doesn't matter. Uh, I may be a Japanese American and the Asian part, but uh, my inside is very much last 40 years educated in the United States, and inside is very much Western tradition of philosophers I admire and artists I admire. Cezanne is my hero, Matisse is my hero, and the Picasso, Guernica, is the one of the greatest art, I think. So these are my, my insight, internal one, as well as the hokusai and the poems by <laughs> Japanese <laughs> our poets and then all those are really incredible and bilingual and then I entertain both sides of the educators and the educational institutions. Uh, so these are the kind of times we're in. So the function of this feeling, uh, language feeling, a noun is a function of the power of perceiving by touch Physical sensation not concerned with sight, hearing, taste, or smell. That's the nung of feeling. <laughs> nung, right there. And then particular sensation of this kind of feeling of warmth. This idea of warmth, this new generation. Modernists, they didn't care, so they are pretty cold over all of their activities. Pop artists, may, maybe not. <laughs> Pretty much so-called conceptual art, and that name was called. Our uh, Joseph Boy says, now we need warmth in our culture, in our heart. And a warm culture, warm art, warmth. This is uh, one of the, his goals. And then uh, again, idea of feeling, not thinking, but the feeling becomes very, very important. So it's uh, go- going back to the, the kind of, uh, of, uh, of uh, oral cultural days rather than literal days. Somebody who's smart is not uh, this, uh, just a language, and they intellectualize and look at the world, the philosopher, and uh, linguistically openly just uh, do that. Okay, that's one aspect. Another one is artists and the poets. They use the living word, living world. Without life experience, I will not know what kind of poem that is because I have struggled, I have enjoyed all these uh, emotional context I have, so some poetry moves me or moves you. Lived word and a lived language. So that's that. And the particular, okay, this feeling of worms, the general state of consciousness considered independent of particular sensations, thoughts, etc. Okay, this is a noun definition. Adjective is a sensitive, emotion, sympathetic, Feeling is the same kind of uh, definition, synonyms, uh, activity, awareness, consciousness, enjoyment, excitement, pleasure, reflex, okay, response. These are same kind of, and then the feeling of beauty in the city, so I have to check another language, beauty, is not the prettiness or loveliness only, but the characteristics of a person, animal, place, object, idea that provides a perceptual experience of pleasure, meaning, or satisfaction. Now we are talking about the landscape of not only the object, the art object, but the art animals, art places, art person. These are all concerns of the idea of beauty. Aesthetic also, beauty is studied as a part of aesthetics, Sociology, social psychology, and the culture. So these are all part of an interrelated idea of uh, beauty has to come in with it. So, uh, again, beauty is idea of excellence, distinction, elegance, grace, brilliant. We all know that. And then, okay, this is the last part of that. But uh, anyway, idea of here, public art, It's not art in public places. That's called the plop art. And then kind of the uh, uh, history, this uh, 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 beautiful composition. These are very, very important language, by the way. I'm not critiquing uh, the traditional values of so-called our world, but the new world as well. And uh, what kind of things are being challenged as uh, new students, new children demanding uh, us to change as well as we wish to change in a better, wider, understanding world. So these are 
of uh, art school is also, they are not just uh, painting and drawing, but uh, also video art, non-sight art, uh, uh, photography, uh, uh, all the different, totally different media. I had a, uh, one Vietnamese student, and he wanted to study sculpture. And the Kenji, I don't want to use nails. Can I use a rope and tie everything? He said, go ahead, beautiful. I want to see how, what kind of sculpture you made. Incredible. He tied everything, <laughs> all the twigs, <laughs> and, then, you know, just the, and then made a little shelter for himself to hide. You know, how nice to be a teacher when <laughs> things happen like that. You know, it's beautiful, isn't it? Yeah. We all know as a teacher, sharing other values. And that they come straight out of you. And that they say, is this art? Of course. Aesthetic experience is the art. Not label, static, but the dynamic aesthetic experiences. Shared, especially. Wow, that seems like a democracy. So in the public spaces, their language, their starting point is really the sociological, anthropological, or cultural background of each other's differences to enjoy. Not the sameness. And it's very important. We have idea of craft, and then I have Warren McKenzie as one of my best teacher and the best friend ever, and we share the quality of what we do. He is so-called the Minge movement. It's a people's art. He doesn't care his signature or his thing anymore. He just throws every day part. I make parts, Kenji, that's all. And he sells his parts, $5, $3, for children, 50 cents. Same part. He just prices differently. So children can afford buying his part. I think this is democracy at work. Non-capitalistic definition at work. Kind of rhizomically, we grow into the real world and the sensing world. That which becomes concrete, not abstract. So public artist is a totally different kind of, it's important to be historically constructed aesthetic experience. That is important, whether Japanese or Chinese or Vietnamese or German or Swedish or English. But at the same time, this new world is challenging. Ecological world, green world is challenging us. I work with the landscape architect, just finished our green roof project for General Mills. It was a wonderful experience with the architect, the landscape architect, and me. Tiny, stupid me, learning all that. So, uh, I think our city of Fargo, I think what it needs is a much more citizens' dialogue and each other's kind of allowing to become dialogical conditions. And then our uh, Bush Foundation is also doing the citizens' dialogue and the citizens' ideas to become part of the uh, city values and the community values. I think it's very important. So all of you have an incredible background and then uh, diverse experiences. Uh, not calling a public art or public artists, but the public intellectuals production of public citizens and the multicultural citizens, we ourselves have to become multicultural beings and then uh, try challenge the new world, I think. So anyway, this is uh, just uh, part of that. And then the last two, uh, I'd like to have Megan Reed, uh, uh, Microsoft, uh, Paul Allen. Everybody knows <laughs> who he is, right? So. Okay. Okay. In my own philanthropy and business endeavors, I have seen the critical role that arts play in stimulating creativity and in developing vital communities. The arts have a crucial impact on our economy and are an important catalyst for learning, discovery, and achievement in our country. Jonathan Fenton, President. MacArthur Foundation gives a genius grants. 
There is no better indicator of the spiritual health of our city, its neighborhoods, and the larger region than the state of the arts. The arts deepen our understanding of the human spirit, extend our capacity to comprehend the lives of others, allow us to imagine a more just and humane world. Through their diversity of feeling, their variety of form, their multiplicity of inspiration, the arts make our culture richer and more reflective. Thank you. Oh, uh, that's the last one of the summary. Louis M. Uh, Slaughter, U.S. House of Representatives, New York. Across America, cities that once struggled economically are reinventing and rebuilding themselves by investing in art and culture, a proven catalyst for growth and economic prosperity. By creating cultural hubs, nonprofit arts businesses help cities defend themselves, draw tourists, and attract investment. Federal support for America's nonprofit cultural organizations must go on if we hope to continue enjoying the substantial benefits they bring. Thank you very much. Yeah. So, so uh, statistically speaking, uh, uh, next 10 years, of, uh, even uh, over here, uh, let's say, Fargo Moorhead is a really great educational city and uh, wonderful universities that they have. And next 10 years, about 30 to 40 percent of the professors will retire. That's the statistics. And after the retirement, then what kind of professors you'd like to have? What kind of values that they'll bring? <laughs> Excellent ones. Or diversity, or not. I think these are kind of community decisions and the participation certainly can make. So it's that kind of a, a world. Our museum also uh, has been changing, and then I'm so glad that the, every museum seems to have a sculpture gardens and then a lot more community involved temporal works no longer permanent works only. Architecture also, it's a temporal architecture, <laughs> goes on. And uh, uh, in the United States, like uh, maybe I, I give architecture 100 years, it lasts, that's the most maybe architectural practice. In Japan, 30 years, that's all. And then uh, that's it, new generation who will build a new, new house. So all these uh, cultural differences are very kind of interesting. So, this changing world and then a green, ecologically sustainable world, how we go about it will be also included to the future aesthetic endeavors. And then part of it, I'm so glad that Colleen and then Megan is working very, very hard to include all the different kind of constituency, include the different kind of disciplines to be able to utilize the museum as a core or hub of these activities and then share with all of us. So, yeah. Anyway, that's my sort of case samples and then all that. So my presentation ends here. And thank you very much for your attention. Okay. <laughs> and a little bit of time is left. If you have any questions or, or if you'd like to discuss, or, I'll be more than glad to do that. Yeah. Well, thanks so much, Kenji. My name is Mike Williams. I'm the city commissioner here in town. And um, through our Go 2030 process, we're hearing that, you know, this is not just a one-time thing that, like you said, this communication and dialogue and, and engagement of the community for picking the best ideas right. and, and getting behind them is important. But one thing that I always find about art or nonprofits and, and the government is that is to me, I think money gets in the way mm -hmm. a lot of times. And mm -hmm. I didn't hear you talk much about yeah. money. And I think uh, what I'm starting to hear from the art community and maybe from our own planners and our citizens is not so much that there's going to be some big iconic project or, like you said, prop art all mm -hmm. over town, yeah. but maybe just to incorporate the, and, and uh, uh include, well, use the artist and the art community as a resource in all that you do. I yeah. mean, so then like your infrastructure, right. uh, there's an art component to that and every, you know, everything that you see. It doesn't yeah. mean that we aren't going to have specific pieces of art, mm -hmm. but just to uh, 
uh, integrated into everything you do. So it's not something that you just slap on afterwards. So, yeah. okay, we're spending a hundred million bucks on a project. Now we're going to give a million to, to the artists. Yeah. That seems backwards to the way things are starting to, to right. pan you know, out here. Yeah. I, I, thank you for the comment on the, these things, you know, like uh, how uh, economic support is very important for any kind of our activities, you know, and then uh, uh, especially like uh, art, we spend incredible money for football players and the baseball players and ice hockey teams. Uh, even tuition universities spend like a uh, 150 individual students has to pay to support the you know, st sport activity, but they're not art. When the program is cut, first thing it goes from elementary school, or junior high, or high school, art. We don't need it. And the, Colleen and I were talking about, wait a moment. <laughs> the cities, if you remember, beautiful cities you have visited, what do they have? Just think about that. Paris, London, Kyoto. <laughs> they have incredible aesthetics, diversity of that, and the buildings and, and all these things. It's not just the utilitarian things that we need or excitement or temporal stuff. Okay? We really need the city, which we think is beautiful, almost as even copying <laughs> the activities, you know. Here, I think, uh, if we're going to spend the money, or uh, if we are going to support, yes, don't say art. <laughs> then uh, right away, everybody gets into the object, and then something permanent, all these things. But the aesthetic experience every day, if we can saturate ourselves within that kind of things, from street levels to my dining room, that would be incredible dynamic life <laughs> and the shared qualities we can challenge to each other. So these are, so a lot about us, we do pro bono work, free. <laughs> Just like a pro bono work by the lawyers, you know, or storefront lawyers, it's some kind of like that. I participate for the community work. Okay, no money, all right, fine, no problem. Let's try donation from the end there. I go to work and then uh, uh, start a project. Indeed, the St. Cloud State University, when I worked uh, one project, we, we, we only had a $5,000, uh, which I shared with the students labor, $10 an hour, we, all that. We started out, and then uh, when you go to St. Cloud State University, right in the middle, you can see that a little gathering space. Okay, anyway, we made about 20 years ago, so. But uh, when we started, one guy came and the Kinji, I own a nursery, and it's full. <laughs> it's all the tree leaves went down, and I cannot sell the tree. <laughs> Can you use it? Of course, yes, great. You know, bring it over. We'll plant it next year. It will be beautiful. All those river birch and everything else. Okay. And then while we were making again, one of the graduates came, and then hey, I work for the Cold Spring <laughs> Granite Company. We got the stones, can you, you want to use it? Yes, thank you very much. We'll deliver it for you. Okay, you do with the student. They came free, okay? Another one, church went down, all the church in the St. Cloud. Priest came and the Kenji, we have a beautiful stones and the foundation stones. Would you like to use it? Yes, thank you very much. Once project is known, $5,000 project became, at the end, I'm quite sure it's about $30,000, all in kind. When the project is good, when somebody has a mediating kind of thing, it's okay, that can happen. Yeah. And the students, uh, they do the free, free labor. Kinja, I don't care. I want to help on the weekend. And, and, uh, so. Well, one of the things that's been coming up is with planning again, you know. So hmm. instead of having like a, well, and maybe in, 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 in unison with having a, a, like the arts partnership that's kind of a consortium of arts right. groups. Uh, maybe like at their planning committee or planning commission, mm -hmm. maybe have a designee from their mm -hmm. uh, that department on planning. So everything that comes through for that's going to be done uh, is there, you know, yeah. and, and maybe, uh, you know, that way uh, the resources that the art community has 
are vast, but what they don't have is money. And the, the cities and the governments are, are, they are, they have a certain amount of money that they use and they invest every year in the community. Yeah. But then that's a way to incorporate that art aspect into it and help. I think, right. I think the, the beautiful community that you talk about, right. then you build the industry so the artists have, it, it builds on itself mm -hmm. and it becomes more of an industry for those artists. Right. And it's more attractive for more artists and more people. Is that right. kind of an idea that yeah. you're talking about here? You know, I'm pretty sure Colleen and a few others uh, teachers, uh, you might have uh, ideas and, uh, you know, we can chip into that kind of things. But uh, again, uh, this language art is a kind of block, <laughs> you know. We have to change to maybe prior to art or craft or design, aesthetic experience. Experience that the politics, mm -hmm. the politics behind the word aesthetics, yeah. are going to be equally okay. So art has all the stigmas attached to it of object, material, public. Don't forget the maintenance mm -hmm. of it, and while we're at it, mm -hmm. so you go and change it to aesthetic. So, yeah. let, so let's create all aesthetic experiences in, yeah. a, in a space. The politics behind that are going to be well, whose aesthetics should stand, okay. which aesthetics yeah. should should have yeah. more value. Again, we are. Multicultural world of uh, all the uh, different background, <laughs> different races, and then uh, we have to. It's just like uh, becoming a politician again. That uh, you can never get the constituents a hundred percent vote, right? Only sixty percent, and uh, you do four years of service. Uh, Fifty-one percent. <laughs> Sometimes only ten votes difference between this and that, and yet uh, we do that. So it's not 100%. We cannot. No artist can satisfy 100% of a so-called audience. It's impartial audience, or we become audience also. Artists become audience. And they support other artists. You know? So it's that kind of thing, too. That, uh, to me, it's, a, it's a, one of, uh, again, my student of... Uh, he is a wonderful artist, and he is teaching uh, at the university and in a few places. But the, his living room, he opens up, it's called Occasional Gallery. His living room, he opens up two seasons as a gallery, and he shows his friend's work in his living room, and he's a gallery owner during that time. That kind of activity, you know? So, uh, it's... it's uh, object to, to artists, not just a producer, but the also our uh, audience or consumer, uh, uh, people who give some money to that uh, what kind of, not just an object buying all that, but uh, it's, a, it's a supporting artists' activities, uh, their thinking, their relationship to the world. And I love that relationship, what he's doing and then they're doing. So we, we Right now, we are kind of uh, two beings. <laughs> One is a formal part. We affirm that, and then we teach, and then we practice that. I make drawings, and then I do all that the traditional stuff, welding, <laughs> and then even casting with a few other friends. Okay, I do that. But at the same time, this publicness, different activities, different community building, Different idea of this temporal work, immediate work, new media, new concerns, new relationship to, with other intellectuals, all these things are part of, I think, a new gen generation of artists. So they, they, they are, uh, some of them, they are poets, <laughs> they are filmmakers, and they do the things. So teachers also, I have met uh, Tama University in Tokyo, uh, this university, Master's program is art and anthropology. They teach both. Okay. And, and the teachers are philosopher, poet, and art historian, and artist. Team teaching. And those teachers, who is a poet who studied in England, as well as Japan. Another one is also studied in our Scandinavian country, somewhere, Sweden, and then all that. 
and another one is Germany. So all these, uh, their educational background is not just uh, in one country. They went out and studied other countries' uh, value systems and then their system coming back and trying to teach or share more like it. So these are the kind of new generation. It's not what I do or we do. It's a, it's a demand, a cultural demand that creates a certain idea of artist or creative people or intellectual. It's no longer just uh, how many books you have read. <laughs> you know? So these are the kind of things. So it's, it's a, now we call it a rhizomic growth. You know? It's no longer a linear part. Yeah. Uh, rhizome, it's just a, whenever, wherever there's a group and then uh, like a, we do one project and then we dismantle that. Thank you very much. And then we go to another group and then we produce something else again. And these are the next generation of artists even will, whatever we are teaching will be absolutely meaningless in five, 10 years maybe. But what they have learned in, in, the, in, the, in the experience of hands-on and the tools and the souls and then all these tools will never change. Brush and then all these will not change. That will be there. But the interpretation to those tools will change. And then they will have another job, another job, another new relationship to the world. So, oh, uh, so many of um, my students are already s studying in China <laughs> and then uh, teaching in China. <laughs> the next generation, it's like uh, the guys who are studying business in Harvard. You know? they, they have to study Chinese, it's uh, compulsory. <laughs> Next world is Chinese coming <laughs> or going over there. So it is the, the kind of another long range, I think, it's needed. And then public art is a very, very important issue, at least to me, uh, to share the kind of another integrity, another empathy, another learning situation. Once you have that, no matter what kind of situation changes, one will have uh, diversity to, to be challenged and uh, to challenge. And uh, sorry, see, we got the aesthetic experience. <laughs> we'll go into that. Okay, just to kind of follow up on Mike's question, too. Uh, you know, when I think about feeling beauty in a place, a lot of it has to do with differences in scale. And in Fargo, one of the things that I love the most is some of the surprising, more like uh, street art, uh, guerrilla creati creativity. Uh, the knitters that, uh, you know, they knit little, um, I don't know what you call them, but they put little knittings around trees, light posts. And I'll be biking down the street and there's one, there's like a, almost like a scarf or a sock around a light pole. Is that pole. in winter time? Every, every oh, season. Every season. And it's surprising, and it's colorful, and it's mm -hmm. unexpected. Mm -hmm. And I love it. Yeah. You know, and I think there's some creativity that's going on here. And I think what you're talking about with the new art that so many artists are engaged in, they want to work in this way where it's not necessarily in a gallery. It's not you know, in a frame, mm -hmm. on a wall. Uh, and they want to work in the community, and that's a great thing that we we need to support. Yeah. Uh, you know, a lot of my background was in folk art, and I, I love and respect that kind of traditional work that people do without necessarily even going to school. But then the city is also about scale, so and public projects and you know, cities and city governments can do these, you know, big design projects, redevelopment. And those are really important, too. And that really has a lot to do with how you experience the space, uh, buildings, how you interact with people, how you move through your day. And, you know, it seems like we need, we need art or aesthetic experience at both ends, not only through the bubbling up from you know, guerrilla artists or public artists who right. want to do temporary projects, but really thinking about the bigger infrastructure mm -hmm. and also 
what can a city government do or mm -hmm. what can citizens do mm -hmm. uh, as a collective through their cities that individual artists or even small groups or even nonprofits can't mm -hmm. do. Mm -hmm. So can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah. Oh, uh, oh wait, I guess you, you don't need that. Yeah. yeah. One example, this I had a story that the New York, you know, Manhattan, like crazy density, like a Tokyo and all that. But they have Central Park, okay? Even east side, of, or maybe Second Street and the Second Avenue, people who are living in a tiny apartment, they know in the head Central Park is there. That's why they can survive. Now, that's a beautiful story, I think. Yeah. So, it is necessary to have a really long range project too. Teresa, I'm sorry, requires at least 50 to 150 years to say, my God, thank you very much. Somebody planted this tree and I'm sitting under the shadow of the tree and I owe to last two generations. My sister and my, my brother-in-law, they just uh, our contract to ha have a little mountain in the northern part of Japan property, okay? Uh, they rented this property with the trees, and then our contract is another 50 years that they'll harvest it. So his, uh, our, my sister's grandchildren, if they want to build a house, they can use that tree <laughs> to build a house. Okay? That's different sense. <laughs> I told her, you are beautiful, thank you, that's great. You know, so these are kind of long range ones. You know, it's a natural landscape takes time. It's not instant beauty <laughs> or instant. Also, uh, like uh, this, uh, another community effort trying to get the money for the new building and then all that, I'm trying to gather the money. So, uh, in uh, Nara, uh, the great Buddha, uh, after the cast of bronze was d done, okay, architecture was built to cover the, uh, from the weather to protect the Buddha. So building was later, after first the sculpture, later uh, uh, building. And the people, I, I indeed, when I took my son and daughter to Nara and I look at this, uh, this building, they were selling in front of this temple, they were selling one roof tile, okay, uh, of a ceramic roof tile. And it was like uh, $10, okay. You buy the roof tile and then you sign the, the name and this will be piled, everybody buys the, these things. And as their roof gets damaged by the weather and all that, they replace with that. So you don't know when they're gonna use it, but the, one of the roof tiles is mine and my daughter's. <laughs> That's the kind of you know, actual participation. It's not the money doing that, but the, you spend the money, but the actual this physical relationships. And the, that's the, that's the uh, kind of ecology. <laughs> that's the kind of sustainability of uh, activities so that uh, you can transfer into that kind of relationships. It's a new relational aesthetics, let's say. Yeah. Again, I'm using aesthetics, but the relational beauty. Like uh, new relationships by doing that something makes more sense, or we understand <laughs> the importance of it. So relationships, I think these are kind of things. But uh, yeah, anyway, uh, the, the economics and then uh, this idea of uh, art is uh, uh, arts and the letters, let's say, both. I think it's a uh, absolutely untapped. We are scared of uh, being, oh, that's uh, again a beautiful, you know, beautiful thing. Uh, of, uh, wow, I, I cried with that movie. Or uh, I think she's beautiful or something like that. Okay, this, we are scared to express ourselves. <laughs> then you're responsible, why? <laughs> Cannot say to you in the language, please go see the movie and you tell me what you think. <laughs> That kind of thing, you know. So, I, I, I think the food is also that. Uh, I think it's an art. It's not just a eating. It's not a quick meal. But uh, I think uh, what kind of dish you serve, <laughs> what kind of, uh, of uh, uh, 
conversation you have, all these things. Uh, food is one of the very, very important aesthetic experience of daily life. And uh, I think it's not, nothing to do with the just the feeling stomach. It comes with all the other experiences. So maybe we can re-examine that kind of thing also. So, food, right? <laughs> yeah. Um, Kinji, I just had a, yeah. I had to read, so I didn't, was yeah. hoping I maybe get to ask a question. I, I've been kind of thinking about some of these statistics in, in, pro, in trying to promote creativity um, with politicians and with business people. Um, I mean, it, it's pretty, pretty broadly acknowledged that the arts, for every dollar spent, brings in three more dollars, right? It's, it's also a, a fact that the Metropolitan Museum of Art brings in more tourism dollars than all of the sports sports teams in New York. Okay. That's pretty, you know, yeah, seriously. Yeah. Uh, so this seems quite obvious um, to me. Um, what doesn't seem so obvious, though, is how we can uh, facilitate politicians to understand that it's not just a dollar mm -hmm. and cents question, mm -hmm. um, but that it is about 21st century skills and it's about allowing, allowing avenues of entry for artists. You know, I, I'm trying to think of what kind of methods or approaches or even mechanisms, because I actually do believe there needs to be some mechanisms set up. I'm not really in, 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 in impressed with the idea of having one artist mm -hmm. or arts organizations sit mm -hmm. on a planning committee yeah. with no real power and no real influence. I'm more interested in having dialogues and discussions so that lots of different voices can come in and lots of different opportunities to have kind of new and innovative ways. Mm -hmm. um, but there has to be concrete mm -hmm. money and infrastructure put in yeah. to investing in the arts. No serious creative community from Bilbao to you know, Seattle you know, realizes that you can't put in, you know, we just put a little bit of money in here and there. There needs to be a real commitment. Yeah. And as far as, as far as I understand, um, I would really like to see the 2030 um, comprehensive plan reflect this in a much broader way. I think it's just a wee little paragraph right now. But this idea of creative thinking skills and, you know, it, everything that we're wearing, from that color shirt to those brown shoes to you know, Stevie's fantastic, you know, outfit. Um, all of these started in the eye of an artist. So if you don't put money and infrastructure into how, mm -hmm. you know, we, we make things, we see things, we develop, how can you actually yeah. move forward? So the, how, it's actually maybe more for the politicians. How can you, as our politicians, um, help provide a better plan that's much more, um, you know, that we have a rhythm effect yeah. in the arts and all the areas? Yeah. I'll answer the way I think about it. And so, you know, again, instead, there's a, there's a way. You could put 1% of the general fund budget to art. Okay, so then you might have a million bucks. Would you rather have a million bucks or would you rather have access, because we spend $70 million a year on infrastructure. Now, wouldn't you rather have a... <laughs> well, <laughs> would, it, and I'm not saying it's either or. I'm not saying it's either or and or, right. But I, I guess my point is, is that having that, that resource, and that's what I think of it as intellectual capital that the, that the artists and, and various people from different expertises have. Uh, it, it's, a it's a holistic view of the community to tap into talent as a, as a resource. But see, it's not, I think we're thinking too uh, fiscally here is that, what are you thinking? Are one person have an influence or just this complete community dialogue recognizing that this is a common goal of the community and when we're spending 70 million dollars on infrastructure we want to make sure that at least the people that uh, may have ideas have an avenue into that because I've heard some talk that well we don't feel engaged or we feel disenfranchised we're not part of the process and I think that that may be a, a mechanical way to get into the process even though it's just one person at least you've got uh, it's not one person all of our meetings are open so then when it gets it becomes awareness of, of the network and what's going on in the various uh, uh, committees. So it's up to the, the community to engage. You can't make people get engaged. <laughs> That's, I mean, the, the, the first thing of doing change is showing up. And when there's, there's a, a lot of public meetings that we have an empty audience here, 
And then we're, you know, we're wondering how do we get access? We're begging for access. That's why we broadcast these these things on TV. So I think we're real close to what we want to do. And I think we, we can identify barriers and we can beat them down, but I think we can make some real quick progress right now instead of just having a, a, a specific pot of money that we want. I think that we can do both. But right now, let's tap into what, what we're already spending and make sure that that they're engaged in that process so we're, we're not missing a, a, a huge aspect. Well, um, more of a comment. Uh, being recently graduated um, and seeing the apathy that has roots that run very deep um, throughout this community, and it's interesting to hear that it's also on a political level as well, um, I, I would be very interested to hear how exactly you could combat something like that. Yeah, I think, I don't know, you have percent for arts program here, this thing. city. Oh, okay. But, but, but the thing, but the thing yeah. and well, that I'm kind of irritated by is that we keep going back to money and artists will produce work regardless if there's money there or not. That's right. I mean, yeah. It 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 is it is something in us that yeah. this is what we do. Yes, it's Stevie. <laughs> that somehow artists should volunteer their time or volunteer their... I agree that artists, we do it not because... There's something in us. Otherwise, we wouldn't do it. And, and hell, we take a whole lot easier career if that was something. But to say that money isn't a product of it or money isn't a reason, we can't just keep ignoring that one as, a, as something that artists... Starving artists. I mean, that's there's a stigma associated to art that either we need to change it Without saying, uh, without saying possibly aesthetics, because then that might get the stigma. But to hell with the volunteering. We do so much of it. But there are artists who, there are artists who specifically eschew any kind of financial reward, and there are many of them throughout the world. Well, I'm not. I'm not saying that artists don't. Um, want or need some kind of value, monetary or otherwise, placed on their work, we do. But that is not the primary drive of what we do. And what I want to say is that we need to, more than just supplying the money for it, which is a very important part of it, we need to be generating and fostering a spirit within the community and we lack that here. I, th I sincerely believe that. I kind of disagree with us to lose the studio art crawl that generated. The studio art crawl was quite successful. It was free to the public. It, and people went and they bought art from it. Um, again, I'm not disagreeing that artists do things because they need to, but we really need to disassociate. And I see no reason that we should keep the phrase starving artist and do it for the sake of it as part of, as part of what art is. Yes, we do it because there's something in us, but hey, I, I'm sorry. There's no way not that more volunteering or more service is needed from artists. It's not just about having the space for it. It's about having the resources, and that means being paid for our time for it. Well, I lived in Denver for a while and um, have a fondness as a graphic designer for uh, nonprofit pro bono work. But, you know, yet I had to pay a mortgage, so it, it's got to be some money coming in. But I worked for a modern dance company. And they said, you know, the work you do is fantastic. And, and they're really act they were really active in the community. But the owner of the studio said to me, you know, we've, we've got to fight television. If there's a great rerun of Seinfeld on Tuesday night, we've got to consider that when we plan our schedules. So I think as artists, we all have the best intentions in, in mind. 
we all donate way too much of our time and, and resources and our art, but it's fighting other things like television and causing the public to make art a habit, like exercising or having a good diet. And it's the, always the best things you're doing are the first ones to fall off. So we need to make art and ha a habit, not just a once a year art crawl thing. Yep. And I'll just have one last thing to say. You know, if you don't have that community spirit that's behind the arts, um, why why would the community fund the arts? You bring out the community to emphasize with your activities. That's the starting point. Yeah. Yeah. And so what I'm saying yeah, is in a community yeah. that is so apathetic. Yeah. And and it's getting better here, but um, how do you get people to reach out their hands like that yeah. to each other? Yeah, that's, that's the thing that uh, I think we are trying to say. <laughs> Once you start activities, okay, there will be, if it makes sense, the people will come. Okay. Euclid, uh, I said a 72 years old woman, okay, her maintenance as an art, she started to clean up the sidewalk. That's as an artist cleaning up the city. One small work. While she was doing it, you can go to the, our Euclid's uh, our, our website, okay? Our, you can Google Merle Letterman Euclid, and then she will be saying about this interview, and she talks about that. She was cleaning up, women standing around, and then one of the young ladies, I cannot take it anymore. Let's clean up together. And then she participates to cleaning up the you know, sidewalk together with. Okay? That's the very important part. Apathy or not, okay, you, we, I am responsible to start out something. Okay? That's artists to do out of nothing. It's almost you commence the activity. Her activity was cleaning up the museum when she was at graduate school, cleaned up the museum gallery floor as a maintenance as art. And she has done all these incredible projects now all over the place in a socialist country as well as a different, you know, a capitalist country, all these things. But what she did in a very small project, she did that. Idea of, again, Mel Chen is another artist that uh, he has done one project. It's called the Pig's Island in St. Paul. It's totally polluted, the Mississippi, one of the most polluted part. He wanted to clean up. So he joined with uh, our scientist, and uh, what kind of corn will clean up, the, suck up the mercury from the soil, and the lettuce, and, and all these things. Uh, he went into this one of the most polluted part of Mississippi by himself with a couple assistants, wearing uh, plastic shoes, and then went in. City council people uh, uh, in uh, uh, St. Paul, they said, you cannot go into the pool that the part. Please get out. And he said, no, this is my artwork. Very small. He chained around with the sears of uh, one of the fence area, small circular, and he planted all these things. And one year later, he was going to come back and they harvested and you know, produce the mercury, and he can sell the, that mercury, so next year will become just a little bit bigger <laughs> property, a little bit bigger, 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 all that. And then that was uh, his project. Of, uh, these politicians came and then uh, you cannot do it, okay, you know, we're going to stop your project. He said, okay, I'm going to go to the newspaper, and uh, what we are trying to do, and uh, you, uh, you guys are going to stop, I will ask the public what I'm doing is wrong or not. And then the council members said, forget it, okay, you can do, okay. So he did the project, okay. This project was, our, it was a small one, and then it was our publicized. United Nations, they focused his activities. They invited him to provide this, his experiment, his project to the United Nations. Now, Brazil and all over the world, Africa and then Cambodia, all those places, scientists, they're going to their jungle and what kind of vegetation sucking up all these bad stuff from the earth. And then that that's became our uh, Colorado governor 
paid attention. He or she gathered the money, <laughs> and then, well, we want you to come, and then we want you to clean up our polluted area. So it's a very small one on the beginning. And my student, I want to, to clean up harvest and all these things together. We volunteered. So it's not just making art, but somebody doing the incredible work, we become participant of that. Then apathy, you can erase that. At least in your heart, you are doing something good. And that's all you can do. And others, let alone others who will look at you who are meaningful, meaningless, okay, it'll come. But you have to take the initiative. Then that's the artist. And then no matter how small it is, maybe a little bonsai, <laughs> you know, you can start to plant the tree. And then next year you can go to the bigger field. But that's Mel did. And Mel Chin, also, if you can Google his name, C-H-I-N. It's a beautiful project that he has. So. Well, and, the, and this points out um, the way artists are working in such different ways. And they're working with infrastructure. And we have... Uh, Jackie Bruckner, I, oh, I think Nicole left. Um, Jackie Bruckner, who's going, who's working with the city of Fargo, on the water retention, storm retention basins. I think that's going to be a very transformative project for the city to see an artist working with engineers and working with communities, and working on a landscape. But she comes at it from uh, her training as an artist and uh, working in public spaces. So. I think we need all these different scales from, you know, what bubbles up from artists themselves and connecting with neighbors yeah. and, uh, you know, throughout the community as well as uh, things that are supported and encouraged by the city and our arts organizations. Yeah. And the artists in residency program will be a very important one too. Yeah. Just to structure it, and then artists in residency, we have a budget, and we're going to invite two artists each year, whatever reasons, and the structure will maintain the integrity of that, and then that which you can do. Kenji, you were talking a lot about aesthetic experience, mm -hmm. and afterwards we've been talking a lot about art more narrowly defined, but getting back to the Go 2030 context of this discussion um, and following up on what Colleen said that I think the real issue that we all need to be concerned about really is aesthetic experience of the city and in the city with and, the people and that has to do with landscape architecture and architecture and city planning and civil engineers because civil engineers have a tremendous effect on the aesthetic experience of the city and so really uh, I think we should all be thinking about aesthetic experience, Stevie, even though you see it as problematic, I think it really is the big issue of a wonderful, successful city has a very strong aesthetic experience right. in all realms. That's right. Including but not limited to traditional definitions of art. Right. Visual art, performance art, music, dance, all these are part of it. And uh, Minneapolis is uh, finally <laughs> getting <laughs> slowly. <laughs> but uh, we have a beautiful now dance group and, and all that, too. And uh, we are truly the, the best theater city <laughs> in the performance arts also. So I think th th this is uh, very important. Uh, that, uh, again, interconnectedness uh, of uh, all these arts activity, you know, or aesthetic experiences. And the core is us. If we, we are, if we don't experience just a head level or a photograph level, then it doesn't do good. But if the younger generation gets enthusiastic or that allocation is truly for them to play with, if we have such artists in residency for elementary school, junior high, high school, and the college level. And actually, city council members discuss that budget is one of the essential part of our city growth in the next 10 years. Let's commit ourselves to be 2% or 1%, or even 5% some city there. And in 1963, Seattle started. It's not the national endowment. <laughs> 
city of Seattle started this public percent for art program. So we have a long history and American democracy at work in the aesthetic world. I think this is the challenge to the politicians. And then I have shown MacArthur Foundation and then you know, Microsoft. Their CEO is saying that all these guys are not just engineers in a sense. They are MFAs and the BFAs and then all these artists and then architects and the young guys and they are utterly collaborating. So city has to realize that politically it's possible give opportunity. All that we can do is give opportunity so they can go through the incredible challenge of next global citizen as such. I think, uh, and then hap hap happens from this place, you know, uh, from my studio. I have to do a few things. I don't know where it goes, but I play. And I ask my friends, what do you think, what do you think, what do you think? So, anyway, I, I, I think it's both, though. You know, it's, it's all the world is important to me, as well as the new world is important. And uh, not either or situation, it's both. <laughs> both. And uh, that's what we have to do at this point. Maybe years later we'll change something, but uh, at least our, our world requires that. I think it uh, demands that kind of uh, human being we to become not just a built environment or a nature environment, sustainable world. And again, human beings, so we have to become sustainable being itself. So becoming, not just being, becoming is one of the tricks that dynamically we move from one place to the other. We may fail, of course, but this our American paradigm is failure even good. You can stand up and go again. You know, we don't label <laughs> anybody like that. So anyway, I, I, I think art is just incredible. It's one of the most concrete experience in the shop, in the studio, by moving the brush, by moving the hand saw and the hammer. We, we imagine the house. We imagine the what kind of painting it will be. And then we act on that without knowing what kind of ending will come. So it requires American courage again. You know, so anyway, that's, that's I feel. <laughs> yeah. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you. No, no, thank you. Thank you, Kevin. <laughs> thank you very much. Thank you.